So the Bible reading is First John chapter three, verse eleven to eighteen. If you're looking at your booklet, it's on page twelve. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil, and his brothers righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death, and all who hate a brother or sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need, and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. I've managed to escape being interviewed, thanks Tom, I wasn't looking forward to that, but I did promise I'd just fill you in a little bit. Um, so I've been part of the CU staff team for about six months now, uh, especially helping with cross cultures, and so inevitably lots of people this week have asked me, well, where am I from? Um, it's a little bit complicated, so here's the, here's the short and 95% accurate version. Um, I was born in Sydney, went to primary school in Sydney. I had the blessing of Christian parents who took me to church and prayed for me and taught me faithfully. Uh, Our family moved to Orange in country New South Wales, so I went to high school in Orange. Uh, I did the teenage thing there of a year or so, thinking I didn't want God to exist and I stopped going to church. Uh, But my parents kept praying for me and God is much more faithful than I am, Uh, so I'm back in the family. Finished high school, moved to Canberra to do an undergraduate degree. Uh, Then I got married and we moved to Melbourne. Uh, My wife lived in Sydney, so we moved to Melbourne. We are in Melbourne for about eight years, I think. Uh, And during that time, I studied a little bit at Melbourne Uni. Uh, I did an apprenticeship at Cross Cultures, that was great, and trained at Ridley College. Uh, We had two kids, and then we moved back to Sydney seven, eight years ago, something like that. I had another kid there, and I was working with AFES at Western Sydney Uni. Uh, until last year, I was asked to come back to Cross Cultures. So here I am again. Yeah, that's the brief version. Um, so here's what flows on to tonight's talk. When Imogen and I moved from Melbourne back to Sydney about eight years ago, uh, you know, looking for a new church, of course. So come Sunday, we just visited the church down the end of the street. We, we checked out the website. I knew it would have sound theology, so I thought we'll go and have a look. Uh, the welcome at the door was great. It was very warm. The service was great. Uh, afterwards, we stood around for a while. Got bored of doing that, so I approached a few people to say g'day, and yeah, I had a bit of a conversation. We went back the next week, same kind of thing happened. Uh, the third week, I was preaching somewhere else, but Imogen went, and at that stage, we had a two-year-old and a two-month-old, and after the service, I think she was sitting down at the edge of morning tea or something, looking after the baby. The whole morning, not a single person talked to her. Of all our brothers and sisters in Christ at that church, no one could show enough love to have a conversation. We didn't end up joining that church. On another note, of course, last year there was a certain royal commission. Uh, Looking into churches and other institutions, the commission uncovered an awful lack of love. Uh, Not only a lack of love, but horrific abuse. Uh, Hopefully at a much lower level, many of us will know someone who no longer goes to church because they feel they've been burnt. They feel they've been let down or, or hurt. They've not been loved by the church. Some of us have probably had that experience ourselves. And probably, actually, most of us, at different times and at different levels, will have been perpetrators of that lack of love to our brothers and sisters. It's so sad, isn't it, when brothers and sisters in Christ don't love each other. When we don't love, it leads to loneliness, it leads to alienation, and even to abuse. 1 John has a lot to say about this topic. 1 John tells us to love our brothers and sisters. And it does so in no uncertain terms, doesn't it? I'm sure you've noticed that so far. It's a book that demands that we love our brothers and sisters. Uh, But the message of 1 John also enables us to love. It's a book of strongly worded commands 
but also of great encouragement. 1 John commands us to love our brothers and sisters, but it has a message that enables us to love them. 1 John tells us that we love because he first loved us. Uh, In fact, if you've got your booklet open, you could scratch out the title of this talk and replace it with that. We love because he first loved us. Uh, You can see the outline in the booklet there so you know where we're going. It'd be good to have a Bible open or flick back to the the manuscript thing. Um, I puzzled for a while how to structure this talk. Uh, Andy was saying 1 John's for art students, isn't it? Um, I'm not an art student, I'm just a simple musician, I like to know the structure of things. So I'm I'm trying to go through in 1 John order more or less, but I've cheated a little bit so that we've got who and why and how. So we'll see how we go that. So the first question is who? Who are we to love? Um, I'm sure you've noticed as you've been reading through this week that 1 John uses the term brothers and sisters a lot. Uh, But who are they? How do they come to be brothers and sisters? The term's first mentioned in chapter 2, and another great place to look that Andy took us to last night is the first part of chapter 3 that talks about how we became brothers and sisters in Christ, how we became God's children. Uh, But actually, I think the best place to start is back in chapter 1. The key term there is fellowship. It's the concept of fellowship that tells us who the brothers and sisters are. So have a look in in John chapter 1. I'll just read from verse 3. We declare to you what we've seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we're walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light... We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, what do you think of when you hear the word fellowship? I think most of us probably think of a group of people, don't we? Like the the Fellowship of the Ring, or the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students, or that tea-drinking, biscuit-eating set on a Sunday morning after church, that kind of thing. That's a little bit the impression we get from the first half of verse 3, isn't it? The first half of verse 3, we declare to you what we've seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. Yeah, could take it a little bit like, well, we're telling you the secret password now, so you can join the club with the rest of us. But actually, that's not it, is it? If you look at the rest of verse 3, so I've lost it now, the rest of verse 3, so you may have fellowship, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So to paraphrase, I think, the first few verses of 1 John, hearing and believing the gospel puts us in fellowship with God. Okay, so which means when we're in fellowship with God, we're in fellowship together with other believers. We belong together because we each belong to God. We belong together because we belong to God. I think that's the definition of fellowship that these first few verses of John gives us. We belong together because we belong to God. You can see the same thing in verse 6 and verse six and 7. So verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him while we're walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. Okay, so in verse 6 equates walking in darkness with being out of fellowship with God. So the reverse must be true, isn't it? If we're walking in the light, then we're in fellowship with God. And then verse 7 makes the connection, well, if we're in the light, in other words, if we're in fellowship with God then we have fellowship with one another. Do you see the order that works in? If we have fellowship with God, then we have fellowship with one another. We belong together because we belong to God. Um, Have you ever been to a footy match and and sat next to another group of people that you've never met before, but they're wearing the same colours as you? Have you ever done that? I never have. I haven't been to footy matches, but but I can imagine. (laughs) Or... Perhaps you've been travelling overseas and you've bumped randomly into another Australian that you've never met before. There's a sense of connection, isn't there, with with either of these groups, Australians or or Carlton fans or or whatever it is. You belong together somehow because you both have a connection with the footy team or with the country or whatever it is. Fellowships like that. We each have a connection with each other because we have heard and believed the gospel. We belong to God and so we belong together. And the term John uses through the rest of his letter for this idea is brothers and sisters. 
John describes those we are in fellowship with as our brothers and sisters. Uh, It's an apt term, isn't it? Because it reminds us that you can't choose your family. A family doesn't form because a small group of people happen to get along or happen to like each other. A family is not about shared interests, uh, interests in whatever it is, particular foods or movies or games or sports. And so it is with our church family. We don't get to choose each other. Instead, we belong together because we each belong to God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I want to talk about church just for a moment. Uh, 1 John doesn't use the term church. That's why I've used the word excursus in the outline. Okay? So it's connected but a little bit separate as well. Uh, I, I want to describe church as the community of brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? So our church community is both local and global. We are in Christian fellowship with our brothers and sisters across the world but also with the brothers and sisters we meet with every week. So church is a visible expression of our fellowship with other believers. It's a visible expression of fellowship with other believers. Just picture in your mind for a moment your brothers and sisters that you see at your church each Sunday morning. Can Can you see them there in your mind? Why are they your brothers and sisters? Why do you belong together with that group of people? Well, you belong together, don't you, because you all belong to God. And just think about the huge variety of people that there probably are at your church. How old is the oldest person? How young is the youngest person? Are there people with PhDs and other people who never finish school? Are there unemployed people? Are there people who are full-time parents, people with very impressive-sounding job titles? Are there people from lots of different ethnic backgrounds? Are there few people who always seem grumpy or whingy? Are there some annoyingly opinionated people? And what about that bloke who's really, really shy and just awkward to talk to? You probably don't actually have a lot in common with many of the people at your church. Uh, Your brothers and sisters in Christ are probably not the sort of people you'd naturally choose to be friends with. But you belong together. You all belong to God, and so you belong together. Uh, All of you at your church are loved by God, and so you are called to love each other. We love because he first loved us. So please keep those people in mind that you've just been imagining, you've just been recalling from Sunday morning or Sunday evening. I think about them as we keep thinking tonight about how to love our brothers and sisters. And think especially about those who are quite different from you. Uh, Just a very brief caveat here. Uh, 1 John, I'm sure you've noticed, talks a lot about insiders and outsiders, doesn't it? It talks a lot about loving insiders, that is, loving our brothers and sisters, And John's message about outsiders is more just be careful, don't be deceived. Uh, Though Jesus, of course, tells us to love our enemies. And that's really important. We are to love our enemies, not just our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, It's just that that's not what we're talking about tonight, okay? So I don't want to forget about that. Uh, But just for tonight, looking at 1 John, we're focusing exclusively on loving other Christians. doesn't mean we're excused from loving those who are not Christians, not at all. It's just not what we're talking about tonight. Okay, so that's who we are to love, the people in our local church and in other churches as well, Uh, people who are all very different, not necessarily easy to get along with, but our brothers and sisters, we belong together because we belong to God. Okay, let's move on to why then, why are we to love our brothers and sisters? Uh, Please turn over to 1 John chapter 2, and we'll start at verse 7. So I didn't write out the line numbers or something. Someone looking at the manuscript, call it out if you found the line number for those using the manuscript. It starts, Beloved, I'm writing you a new commandment. Chapter 2, verse 7. Just give you a moment to find it if, if, if you don't have a Bible there. 34? I don't know if that's right, but it sounds good to me. Excellent. All right, so from verse 7 then. Uh, Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment which you've heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word you have heard. And yet I'm writing you a new commandment that is true in him and you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says I am in the light while hating a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Whoever loves a brother or sister lives in the light and in such a person there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates a believer is in the darkness, walks in the darkness and does not know the way to go because the darkness has brought on blindness. 
Okay, so this is the first place in the letter that this term brothers and sisters is used. And clearly here, John is writing commandment, and so the obvious question to ask is, well, what is this commandment? Is that one of the questions you put up on your butcher's paper in your Bible study groups, maybe for some of you? Well, here's, here's what I think it is. I think it's the new commandment that we hear in John 13. A new commandment I give to you, Jesus tells his disciples, that you love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Um, If you want some confirmation of that, just flick over for a moment to 2 John, 2 John verse 5, uh, which says, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the friends, even though they're strangers to you. Sorry, not verse 5. Uh, That's 3 John, wrong page. Here we go. 2 John, verse 5. But now, dear lady, I ask you, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but one we had from the beginning. Notice the same language from 1 John, the the beginning and the new commandment, and here's the commandment spelled out, let us love one another. Okay, so that's what the new commandment is, this commandment talked about here. Uh, But it's confusing, isn't it? It's described as old in verse 7, and then in verse 8, it's called new. Uh, I imagine some of you have probably been trying to nut that one out in, in your Bible study groups. What's old about it? What's new about it? Well, here's, here's my take. Here's what's old about it in verse 7. Well, you've had it from the beginning. Okay? It's the message you have heard, that you have heard already. It's old. John is not making anything up. I think that's his point. It's the original message that they've always been taught. This is authentic Christianity. Uh, but it's also new, isn't it, in verse 8? What's new about it? Well, Jesus called it new. If Jesus calls something new, that'll do me. It's new. Uh, But also, where the Old Testament says, love your neighbour, Jesus commands us, love as I have loved you. There's a new quality to that love, isn't there? A new extent. The extent that Jesus died for us. Uh, But I think the most important new thing is at the very end of verse 8, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The darkness is passing away. Jesus' love, Jesus' death for us, brings in a new era, a true light, a level of fellowship with God that wasn't possible before. So we are to love our brothers and sisters as Christ loved us. We love because he first loved us. Okay, So there's one reason why we are to love our brothers and sisters. Jesus commands us to. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Jesus tells us to, so let's do it. Uh, But remember too, Jesus says in John 13, by this will everyone know that you are my disciples. Christian community is a really attractive thing, isn't it? And I think by God's grace, that's something that's working really well across cultures. Uh, So we regularly have students who are not Christians coming to Bible study, but even more than that, we regularly have students who are not Christians inviting their friends who are not Christians to come to Bible study. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't God good? By God's grace, it's a great community where people feel welcomed, where people can see Christians loving each other, and they want to be part of that. So please pray that that continues and that we keep on doing it better. And I pray the same thing for your faculty Bible study group and your Sunday church. I pray that these are places where Christians can be seen loving each other and that others will want to be part of that. Okay, so that's the first reason why Jesus commands and as a witness to others. Uh, the second reason I want to take us to, this is the, the verse out of order, is in chapter 4, but we'll be very brief because Andy covered it for us so helpfully last night. But chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll just read it quickly and then we'll just recap very briefly what, what Andy said last night. So chapter 4 from verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Andy summarised that so helpfully last night, didn't he? He said, when we become God's children, we share in the family love. Have I got this right? 
That's what you said, yep. When we become God's children, we share in the family love. We share in the Father's love for the Son through the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Okay, so we're part of God's family love, and that includes loving each other. That's what verse 11 says, doesn't it? Beloved, since God loved us so much, since we're part of that family love of God, we also ought to love one another. Uh, John summarizes that again for us down in verse 19. That, that's worth a look. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Uh, in fact, if you're feeling a bit tired and sleepy last night and you're going to doze off, this is the one thing you need to remember tonight, okay? Write out that verse in your booklet, put a box around it, or doodle some flowers, or whatever it is you do that, that makes things stand out on your page. This is the verse you need to remember. We love because he first loved us. Uh, it's a cause and effect kind of thing, isn't it? It's a cause and effect. God loved us, so we loved others. In fact, I've got um, a little video. We'll see if it works. Okay, there's a cat with some cause and effect. So that's a very, very long way of saying cause and effect, but, but hopefully you'll remember that. Okay, it's simple cause and effect. We love because he first loved us. Yeah, that's our second reason why. We love because he first loved us. I want to go another brief excursus now on forgiveness. Uh, again, this is not something directly addressed by 1 John, uh, but it, it belongs in the topic, doesn't it? Uh, the idea of forgiveness. What do we do with people we have a disagreement with? If someone's disagreed with us or if someone's hurt us, a brother or sister in Christ. What do most people do out, out in a broader society? Uh, perhaps they open Facebook and hit unfriend. Uh, or don't bother sitting next to this person in shoots again. Or just, you know, you can easily just stop being friends, can't you? But we are brothers and sisters, we are called to love as God loved us. We just saw that in, in 1 John chapter 4. We are called to love as God loved us. We can't stop being family. Um, maybe some of you, like me, you know, there's that very, very brief fleeting teenage movement moment where you kind of wish that your parents weren't your parents because you thought they were really daggy. But, you know, you can't stop being family. And so one of the ways we need to love our brothers and sisters is by forgiving them. When someone wrongs us, Offering forgiveness is a wonderful expression of love. I'm not going to talk in detail about how to go about that and so on. Matthew 18 is a great place to start. Uh, but offering forgiveness is a really important way of loving our brothers and sisters. Uh, now, I want to slip in one more why thing very briefly from, from 2 John. Uh, so we've had a bit from John's Gospel in, earlier in the week and obviously lots of 1 John and I see in the outlines, Rob's going to take us to Revelation on Friday, also written by John. So I couldn't resist the temptation here in the middle week just to put in a bit of 2 John and a bit of 3 John as well, just, just to round things out. Okay, so 2 John, um, very briefly, just enough for you to think about a bit more later on. My summary of, of 2 John is that truth and love guard against deceit. Truth and love guard against deceit. So one of the reasons for loving our brothers and sisters is to stop the spread of heresy. Okay, and in 2 John, if you want to read it later on, the key bit is verse 7, which this translation annoyingly has left out the word because from the front off. So verse 7 should start with the word because. So the whole letter is in two halves. Love and truth because deceivers in the second half. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that one with you to think about more later. But another reason why we're to love our brothers and sisters to guard against deceit. Let's move on to how. How are we to love our brothers and sisters? Um, a brief caveat, first of all, just turn over to Colossians 3 from verse 18. I won't read it, but just have a look. I mean, you're all familiar with the passage. Colossians 3, starting at verse 18, that section there. Uh, we need to remember, as brothers and sisters, we're all equal before God, of course. But we do have different relationships with different brothers and sisters. And so that means what's an appropriate expression of love for one brother or one sister may not be a helpful expression of love for someone else. Okay, you can see that principle in, in Colossians 3. Here's a practical example. Uh, my daughter Claire is eight years old. You can meet her tomorrow. She's coming out for lunch with my family. Uh, she's eight years old, but she's a pretty sharp theological thinker, actually. And earlier this year, she pointed out to me that she is my sister in Christ. Isn't that a great thought? She is my sister in Christ. I'm the parent and she's the child. Okay, I'm 40, she's eight. And yet, we are brother and sister in Christ. Uh, but we do have different responsibilities to each other, don't we? So as an eight-year-old, actually it's incumbent on her to do what I tell her to do, not the other way around. On the other hand, it's incumbent on me to provide for her material needs, 
not the other way around. Okay? We are to love each other as brother and sister in Christ, but because of our different roles as parent and child, what love looks like will be different from each of us. All right, now, as a group tonight, this is fairly flat, isn't it? We're not, not many parents and children and no slaves and masters. So I was trying to think of a joke I could make about Rob at this point, but I won't. Uh, we're a pretty flat group, but, but do bear in mind that caveat, that, that some of our relationships with different brothers and sisters will be different. And sometimes what's an appropriate way to love someone will not be an appropriate way to love someone else. Okay? Just keep that in the back of your mind. Okay? On to how. Um, this is not exhaustive lift to how. We could add many more things, but here's a few highlights from 1 John, I think. We'll spend most of our time in chapter 3. I think this is the key passage that we had read earlier. Uh, this passage shows us one of the key ways how we are to love our brothers and sisters. Uh, so chapter 3 from verse 11. Again, it would be worth, if you're looking at the manuscript, it would be worth just taking a moment to find it. I don't know where it is, sorry. But we had it read before, so hopefully you found it already. Okay, so let's just unpack this passage a bit before we get into the practicalities. I think verse 11 is the heading for the passage. So verse 11, this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Okay, notice here he's picking up the same language that he already used in chapter 2, the message from the beginning about loving one another. Uh, he's picking up this same idea from earlier and then developing it some more. Uh, John does that a lot, doesn't he, throughout the letter. He repeats an idea but then develops it or, or shows us something new about it. So in chapter 2, he laid out why we are to love our brothers and sisters. And this verse, chapter 3, verse 11, reminds us of that. Uh, it reminds us that Jesus commanded us to love each other and then goes on from verse 12 to talk about the how. Okay, now, the easiest way, I think, to understand verses 12 to 18 is to play the opposites game. You know the opposites game? So I say hi, and you all say, yeah. I say up, and you say, and some things aren't technically opposites, but near enough. So I say cat, and you all say dog, and apple, and so on. Okay, you get the idea? So there's lots of opposites in 1 John, lots of opposites throughout the book, including in this passage. Okay, so let's refine our game a little bit, and we'll play the 1 John opposites game. Okay, so from chapter 2, we had light and yep, new and old. Okay, now, this section, chapter 3, there's five pairs of opposites. Okay, the first one's a little bit unclear, so have a look at verse 13. This is the hardest one to find. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. Okay, what's the opposite in verse 13 to brothers and sisters? It's the world, isn't it? Okay, that one doesn't roll off the tongue, but there it is in verse 13. The others are straightforward. There's righteousness and evil. It, normally we say good and evil, but righteousness and evil. And then the others, love and hate, life and Cain and Yes, I tricked you all. I thought I would. Excellent. No, the opposite of Cain is not Abel, unless you're reading Genesis 4. But we're not. We're reading 1 John 3. Have a look. What's the opposite of Cain? Who is the opposite of Cain? No, no, his brother's Abel. Yeah, what's the opposite? No, it's not the children of God. You're on the right track now. Jesus, thank you. Cain and Jesus are the opposites. Okay? So with that in mind, all these opposites, especially Cain and Jesus, it's easy to see how this chapter fits together. All right, so verses 12 to 15 are all negative. They've got Cain as the figurehead. They're all negative. Okay, there's a description in verses 12 to 15 of the opposite of loving our brothers and sisters. Cain was jealous of Abel, so he murdered him. You see that in verse 12? We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. Okay, so there's one practicality for us. One really bit of practical advice on how to love your brothers and sisters. If you want to love your brother and sister, don't kill them. Okay? We're all doing okay so far, I think. Okay, come to verse 15, though. At okay, the end of this little section, verse 15, all who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. John deals in very strong words. Hate is a strong word, isn't it? I'm sure none of us like to think of ourselves as someone who hates. Surely we don't hate our brothers and sisters. But what about that person at church or that Christian I know that I'm a bit annoyed at? Or I prefer to ignore because I don't really like them all that much. Well, that person I like to tease. Well, that person who's a bit weird and awkward to talk to. I'll read that list of things again. Please mentally just put a face 
next to each of those things, a face or a name from your congregation, I'm sure you can think of someone for, for each of these things, that, that person that you're a bit annoyed at or that you'd prefer to ignore because you just don't really like them all that much or that person you like to tease or someone who's a bit weird and awkward and difficult to talk to. Who is it in your church or at CU that you feel this way about? Uh, remember, John told us before, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Hate is a strong word, isn't it? Uh, I'm sure none of us would like to think of ourselves as, as hating someone. Uh, but what about bearing an old grudge? Remember that person you had a bit of a run-in with last year? Uh, at the time, I'm, I'm sure you talked through it and, and forgiveness seemed to be offered on both sides, but perhaps the relationship hasn't actually been the same since then. Well, what about current issues that might be facing your church that there's divided opinion over? Maybe it's a building project or the way youth group is run or the music. It can be surprisingly difficult, can't it, to express that opinion in genuine love. It can be surprisingly difficult not to come away from these conversations with, with noses just a little bit out of joint or a little bit distempered at someone else at church. Well, John tells us here in, in verse 15, all who hate a brother or sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. All right, so 12 to 15 are, are some strong reminders. It's all negative. Don't be like Cain. Uh, of course, the opposite of Cain is Jesus. So verses 16 to 18 then tell us, instead of being like Cain, be like Jesus. Okay, verse 16, we know love by this that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Okay, again, we see that we love because he first loved us. Of course, Jesus' laying down of his life was unique, wasn't it? Uh, only he is the Son of God, whose laying down for his life was an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Uh, we can't love our brothers and sisters in that way, can we? We can't die to forgive their sins. Only Jesus can do that. But instead, John tells us, verse 17, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Uh, John's chosen here a really interesting idiom that's, that's translated here, the world's goods or material possessions in, in the NIV. It's more literally the things of life, uh, or perhaps in slightly better English, the necessities of life. Uh, so John isn't asking us to literally lay down our lives, but he is asking us to give up the material things necessary for life in order to help our brothers and sisters who don't have enough. Okay, and then verse 18 goes on, Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in action and truth. Now, I don't think he's saying, don't worry about words and speech. He's not saying that, is he? It is important to love people with our words. Words are welcome when people visit church. Encouraging words. Speaking words of truth to each other as we study God's word together. Uh, words are important ways of loving each other, but John is emphasising here the need for actions. So verse 18 is reinforcing that point from verse 17, that it's about action. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Well, just to explain verse 17 a little bit more and, and also a, a practical how-to, who knows what's happening in Syria at the moment? Uh, there's a refugee crisis going on in Syria that's been on the news a lot a couple of years ago. I haven't heard much about it for a while. Uh, that's compassion fatigue, isn't it? We have compassion fatigue as individuals, and our media certainly does, but there is still a serious crisis going on in Syria. Uh, millions have had homes and livelihoods destroyed. Millions do not have good access to food and medical care. It's easy to forget, isn't it? It's easy not to think about it. Uh, we've never met these people. Here's some of them. They live on the other side of the world. But it's good to remember, actually, as you can see from some of these photos here, that many of them are our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's easy to forget. It's easy to put out of mind. And I think that's a good illustration of verse 17. So verse 17 is literally... Uh, someone who has locked up their compassion. Uh, someone who refuses to help is someone who has locked up their compassion. It's so easy, isn't it, to shut off our care, to shut off our pity for our brothers and sisters in need. 
It'd be a good thing, wouldn't it? I'm perhaps we can pop that slide down now, thanks. It'd be a good thing to keep on helping our brothers and sisters in Syria and other places by praying for them, uh, perhaps by sending money to agencies who are doing work over there to help them. Uh, but here's some more practical examples a bit closer to home. Uh, perhaps you've been thinking, well, I know my sister was cold last night and I should lend her my jumper, but I don't want to interrupt talking to my friends to, to go and get it. And what if my jumper gets dirty or lost? No, no, she'll be okay, won't she? It's her own silly fault for not packing enough clothes for Summit. Uh, or another example. Uh, once, fortunately, before we had kids, Imogen and I had flu really, really badly, both at the same time. We, we got it on a Sunday, and by the next Saturday, we were well enough to sit up on the couch for about half an hour before we had to get to go, go back to bed. We were so sick. Uh, but a friend came over a few times that week to make sure we were okay and, and bring us some soup and some fruit. It was a really great practical expression of love and care. A little bit similar to that, Ray was telling me the other day how in Singapore it's quite common for high school people to visit elderly people who are living alone, do some housework for them, make sure they're okay. Uh, maybe it's something you could do at your church. Uh, who are the elderly people living alone at your church? Or perhaps not elderly, but someone with a chronic illness or a single parent. Perhaps some really practical help would be great. Just go around once in a while and prune the garden or, or wash the windows. Do some of that heavy work that they just can't do themselves. Uh, here's another example. Uh, you know, my family and I, we didn't have the smoothest move to Melbourne at the start of this year. Uh, our removalist, you know, we packed up the house, packed up the removalist van, he drove off and he stole it all. So we arrived in Melbourne with a bit of a shortage of worldly goods. Uh, but a lot of people, and, and Rob's wife Beck in particular, were so helpful at organising people to, to give us stuff and lend us stuff. And, and Rob gave up a Sunday afternoon to drive me to a place where I'd found a free um, bunk bed on Gumtree and cram it into the car and drive it back again. It was such a helpful expression of practical love when we didn't have the worldly goods we needed to set up house. I didn't have a bed for my kids to sleep in. Uh, the story ended well. That, that's, that's just a good practical example. Uh, another one that I want to talk about for a bit is hospitality. Uh, when I first went to uni, when I moved from Orange to Canberra, so I left home and I was away from my family, living in a, in a university residence, and I joined a local church there, and I was invited over for, for lunch with a few other single people by an older lady named Judith. She was a great model of hospitality. Fairly often, about once a month or so, she'd just invite a small group of us over to, to have lunch at her place. It was so nice for those of us who were away from family and away from friends. Uh, she was a great, faithful servant of Christ. And in fact, she'd been practicing hospitality for so long that after we got to know each other a bit and we, we talked, we figured out that uh, she'd been doing this for so many years that one of her guests, however many years earlier it was, 30 years earlier or something, no, it must be more than that, anyway, you can do the maths later, however many years earlier was my mum when she was a university student in Canberra. How's that for faithful service for many years? Let me encourage you to start practicing hospitality now. You don't need a fancy house, you don't need your own house. You, know, you don't need fancy food or be a good cook or anything. It's just about sharing life together. And so I think following Judith's example, I remember one of the early times that I invited a couple of friends over to, to the university residence where I was living to show them some hospitality. Uh, it was my college Bible study leader, and he'd got married, so they'd moved off campus. And so I invited them both back for a meal. And the wife, I, I, I rang them up the day before and said, could you please bring a plate? I think the wife's going to be worried. You know, here's this young 20-year-old who's inviting us over, but he clearly doesn't know how to cook and you know, wants us to bring a plate of food. And I had to say, no, no, I literally mean a plate because I own two plates and there'll be three of us. Okay? <laughs> so you don't need a lot of fancy stuff to be hospitable. It's just about sharing life together. And so important, isn't it? Uh, did you see on the news that the British government has recently appointed a minister for loneliness? Isn't that sad that they need a minister for loneliness? There are so many lonely people in our society, but even in our churches. Let's share our lives together. Just invite people over. How do we love our brothers and sisters? Well, often just with the practicalities of daily life. Okay, let's move on to uh, chapter 5. This is the, the next way I want to talk about how we love our brothers and sisters. Chapter 5, the start of the chapter, verses 1 and 2. Uh, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Okay, so remember, it's loving and trusting God that puts us in fellowship with him. And it's being in fellowship with God that puts us in fellowship with each other. Okay, we're only brothers and sisters because we all love God. 
And if we didn't love God, we wouldn't even be brothers and sisters. So loving God is foundational for loving each other. Can you see that idea in the verses we've just read? That loving God is foundational for loving each other. Again, John is restating our idea from earlier on, from chapter 1, we looked at the idea of fellowship. Uh, He doesn't just restate it here, he builds on it as well. So I think it's fair to say from this first part of chapter 5 then, that as we grow in our love for God, we will grow in our love for our brothers and sisters. As we spend time in prayer, as we spend time reading God's word, as we meditate on what he has done for us, as we look forward to eternity with him, we will grow in love for our brothers and sisters. We will more and more want to share together our joy in God. Um, Now, I did have a a fancy Calvin quote here, but I think I'll leave it. I really just put it in because Andy had all these fancy-looking quotes in his outline. I didn't want to be left out, but let's not worry about it. The last words of of verse 2 of chapter 5 are also really important. So the last words of verse 2, when we love God and obey his commandments... Okay, so this is telling us we love our brothers and sisters by obeying God's commandments. That is, we know how to love each other by knowing and obeying God's commandments. Okay, we know how to love each other by obeying God's commandments. Uh, you might have been wondering why we need this whole long how section in the talk at all. You know, surely you don't need a whole bunch of rules and guidelines on how to treat others. Isn't, isn't the whole point just to love each other? It's, you know, it's all about love. But the trouble is, isn't it, our love is often corrupted by sin. Our love lacks God's wisdom. And so to love our brothers and sisters, we can't just make up our own ethics. We need to know how to love them. And we learn how to love by obeying God's commands. We need to know God's word and we need to obey his commands in order to love our brothers and sisters. Now, just, just one practical example of that. Our society currently is, is debating the rights and wrongs of euthanasia, isn't it? So if a brother or sister in your church has a terminal illness as, and is in great pain, how do you love them? Is it loving to help them die? We need to know God's word to show how to love. I think that's what chapter 5 verse 2 is saying. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Okay, one more, chapter 5, verse 16. Uh, Chapter 5, verse 16, where's it gone? Here. If you see your brother or sister committing what is not a mortal sin, you will ask, and God will give life to such a one, to those whose sin is not mortal. There is a sin that is mortal. I do not say that you should pray about that one. Okay, so finally the verse you've all been waiting for. What's this mortal (laughs) sin? What is it? It's, you know, it's the top of everyone's question list, isn't it, as I walk around the dining room and have a look? Uh, well, it's a big question. What is it? And the question that comes after it is, is John categorically saying that we shouldn't pray about whatever this sin is, or is he just not recommending it? Or is he trying to sidestep the question altogether and say, well, I'm just not talking about mortal sin, so don't worry about it? And the other puzzle in this verse is, well, if praying gives life to a brother or sister, does that mean they're now dead? before I pray for them. And if they're now dead, then doesn't that mean they're not a Christian? So why are they calling a brother or sister in the first place? There's puzzling things in this verse, aren't there? Uh, But I don't want to spoil your fun in your Bible study groups, so I'm not going to tackle them all. Uh, And besides, I'm sure if you really want to know, Helen will have much better answers than me. But no, instead, for just for tonight, let's focus on what is clear about how to love our brothers and sisters here. Okay? Well, first of all, it says, if you see a brother or sister commit sin. Okay? So John here is talking about the sins that we can observe, that we can see people committing. He's not talking about the state of heart. He's not talking about secret acts or unseen attitudes. He's talking here about sin that we can observe each other committing. And secondly, he is talking about our brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, so he's not talking about seeing an axe murder on the news. He's talking about our brothers and sisters in Christ whom we're called to love and whom we live in community with. Could be a number of things, couldn't it? Perhaps gossip. Or if you hear someone making a sexist or derogatory remark. Perhaps it's someone's behaviour or attitudes to their parents that you observe. Or boundaries between a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Uh, perhaps it's drunkenness, you could see that. 
or if you observe someone wasting so much time on social media or computer games that they end up letting down the, the members of the group assignment or their fellow Sunday school teachers. Now, all sorts of things you could observe, aren't there? So when we observe our, our brothers and sisters doing these things, what do we do? How do we love them when we see them sin? Well, sometimes perhaps just gently pointing out their sin might be enough. Um, sometimes we all fall into sinful habits, don't we, without even noticing. And someone just gently pointing it out might be enough to make us realise what we're doing. If someone else has observed me sinning, clearly it's significant enough that I need to repent. And so gently pointing out a sin might be a good way to love your brother and sister. Uh, but John has some much more important vo- advice for us here in, in verse 16. So the second half of the verse, you will ask and God will give life to such a one. He's saying to pray, isn't he? Pray that God will convict your brother or sister in their heart of their sin. Pray that they will repent. Pray that God will strengthen them by his Holy Spirit to no longer sin in this particular way. If we really want to love each other, if we really want to grow in holiness, praying is a great way of loving each other, praying for each other. Okay, one more how. Last how is over in 3 John, so this is not in the the manuscript version, you have to get out your real Bible. Uh, 3 John, we'll just zoom in on verses 5 to 8. Okay, this is about sending missionaries. So, so far we've been thinking more about our local churches, and I think that's good. We're concentrating on our brothers and sisters that we see from week to week. But I want to broaden our horizons here for a moment to global mission. Okay, so first let's look at what verses 5 to 8 are saying. So verse 5, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the friends, even though they're strangers to you. Uh, has someone got an NIV or another translation there? I think it, we won't have friends. Well, it has brothers and sisters. Yeah. Yeah, it's brothers and sisters. It's the same word that 1 John uses for brothers and sisters. I I don't know why NRSV has got friends, but there you go. It's talking about brothers and sisters, and yet did you notice in verse 5, they're strangers. So they're brothers and sisters in Christ, but they're strangers to this person. Okay, Now have a look at verse 7. They began their journey for the sake of Christ, accepting no support for unbelievers. So they're on a journey, and they don't have support from unbelievers. So they're not on holidays, they're not on a business trip. If you put those two verses together, I think we're talking about missionaries here. We're talking about travelling evangelists. Okay, they're brothers and sisters in Christ, but they're strangers to this local congregation that they're visiting. And so how are we to love them? Well, verse 6. You will do well to send them on in a manner worthy of God. Uh, or verse 8. Therefore we ought to support such people so that we may become co-workers with the truth. We can love our brothers and sisters who are missionaries by sending them on in a manner worthy of God, by supporting them. Uh, What does that look like in practice? Well, maybe it's going to see you use weekly prayer time for missionaries. Uh, Perhaps you can adopt a missionary yourself if you haven't done that already. Uh, You can ask to get their prayer emails, support them financially, write to them, pray for them. Uh, You could talk to Brana and Petra tonight and ask them, how could you support and encourage them? How could you send them on in a manner that is worthy of God? John is telling us here that we are obliged to love our brothers and sisters who have gone out for the sake of Christ. Uh, There's one more application I want to draw from these verses as well, and that's about international students going home. Okay, So most international students in Australia are from countries that have quite significant government restrictions on sharing the gospel. Okay, so most international students coming to Australia are from countries that you can't easily get into as a missionary. And so our brothers and sisters who are international students who are returning home are great missionaries, aren't they? They can get into these countries. They know the language. They know the culture already. But of students who have become Christians in Australia and the US and the UK that return to China or Japan, I I haven't seen any research on other countries, but for China and Japan, uh, probably about 50 or as much as 80% fall away after returning home. So if students who become Christians in Australia and then return to China or Japan, as many as 80% of them give up on their new faith. And so we want to love our brothers and sisters by equipping them to stand firm. We want to love them by equipping them to share the gospel with family and friends. We want to send them home well. 
We want to love our brothers and sisters who are international students by sending them home well. How can we send them on in a manner that is worthy of God? Well, that's what we're aiming to do across cultures. Uh, Sometimes people wonder, why is cross cultures a bit separate from the rest of CU? It would be easy to feel like that, that separation could be a lack of love between brothers and sisters, but actually, it's quite the opposite. So there's a key difference, isn't there, between local students and international students. It's not about English language levels. It's not about particular foods or, or anything else. The key difference is most international students will go home. And that means we're discipling our brothers and sisters to be Christians in a very different culture to the one we're living in here. And we want to send them home as effective missionaries. We want to love our brothers and sisters by sending them home well. Okay, so we've looked at who, who are our brothers and sisters, those we're in fellowship with. We belong together because we belong to God. We've looked at why we are to love our brothers and sisters because God first loved us. Uh, We've looked at a lot of different practical ways of how. I'm sure we could add some more, but that's enough for tonight. I just want to finish with one final thought from the book of Hebrews. Uh, We've talked a lot about our brothers and sisters in Christ, and, and one John views us as all being God's children. Uh, Andy helpfully pointed that out to us last night, and I'm sure you've noticed this week that 1 John also frequently calls Jesus God's son. Okay, so we're all God's children, and Jesus is God's son. Just take a moment to join the dots there, and we arrive thinking that Jesus is our brother. Uh, The writer of the Hebrews has joined the dots that way as well. Just turn back to Hebrews chapter 2. I'm just going to read verses 10 to 13. Hebrews 2 from verse 10. It is fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Jesus is our brother. Isn't that a fantastic thought? We've talked a lot tonight about how we are to love our brothers and sisters. Hopefully it's been thought-provoking. Perhaps it's been encouraging. Perhaps it's been a word of rebuke. But let's end not by reflecting on our obligation to love each other, but on how we have been loved. We have been loved by Christ, our brother. Our brother Christ loves us enough to die for us. We love because he first loved us. Our brother Christ loved us enough to die for us. Jesus is the brother who is able to love the brothers and sisters perfectly. Where we fail to love our brothers and sisters, Jesus loves them perfectly. Where we fail, he forgives. Where we fail, he loves us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for adopting us into your family, for making us brothers and sisters. Help us to love each other just as you love us. Amen.